Hi everybody, this is James Chai, uh, our Park 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 Rescue Foundation, and it's been a little bit, uh, sorry, a bit of a delay, having the usual trouble with my Facebook Live, so I apologize. Uh, it's kind of like for 40 minutes trying to get it going, so um, hopefully I got it figured out. Now I'm just doing this from my uh, from my phone for once. Yahoo! So I'm pretty happy about that. And uh, I'll be answering some questions uh, from the viewers' questions. And then, sorry, I just got to try to get this thing off here. And we will just smooth this out. There we go, smooth out. And, or should I, uh, I should have just turned it off. Anyhow, I uh, hope everyone's doing really well. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm getting a better clarity of, of view now on the um, on my Facebook. Uh, now that I'm recording through my phone. I will be transitioning towards YouTube uh, eventually as I work towards that. Um, so just uh, if you don't see me on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, check out my YouTube channel. I eventually will be getting over to that. I am also going to try to set up a somewhat podcast. I'm going to still work on figuring it out. I'm talking to a few people trying to give me some ideas on how to set it up. I, I really don't know how to do it. But once I get that going, I will be doing live uh, training uh, through my podcast and eventually just you know hopefully getting it expanded out and having such a unique aspect of applying it and I'll be able to help people in different countries as well which would be really cool and uh, yeah so that's pretty uh, pretty well all it and um, so I've set up here uh, a few things that I want to talk about in regards to uh, today's uh, uh, thing uh, it's October 30th uh, 2019 episode number 30 and um, so just over the the basic stuff that I want to talk about, and I, um, it's it's going to be, uh, there I go. Sorry, um, it's going to be uh, one of them is going to be when your dog stops at the water bowl but walks away without drinking it, and then it'll be a couple of viewer questions from Jen and uh, Jen Spore and Sammy uh, Bertini, and I don't know if I have anyone else. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to stay on point today. I'm going to keep focusing on getting things streamlined. And hopefully I'll be uh, no more than about 45 minutes today. Okay. So uh, one of the topics are, that I'm going to talk about is when your dog stops at the water bowl but walks away. And then you notice that a lot of times your dog will walk up to your water bowl, up to their water bowl. They'll sniff it. They'll kind of stand there. They look like they're going to drink. And then they decide not to and they walk away. Um, so... Uh, and then it's when the, why they pause, why they stand there seemingly waiting for something, and why they walk away. And I think a lot of people probably know uh, right off you know, your own intuition why your dog is doing that. And essentially, they are making a conscious decision that they don't want to drink water. So what does that mean? Okay, well, yeah, we know the dog doesn't, our dog doesn't want to drink water, goes up and sniffs it and all that. So you, you'll notice if you're just standing there or not even making acknowledgement and they'll get up and they'll kind of wander around your place and then they go up to the water bowl and they kind of look at it like as if they're going to drink it. Like you, you'll notice that before they walk up to the water bowl, they seem somewhat hesitant to walk up to the water bowl and then they walk to it, they smell it, they sniff it, they look at it and they somewhat turn their heads back and forth a little bit and then they'll move forward and walk away from the water bowl. What that is, is a conscious decision. So your dog has some sort of motivation because he gets up to go get, or she gets up to go get water. So I'm going to say Zevia. So Zevia gets up to get water and for whatever reason she walks up to the bowl and she stops and kind of pauses, hesitates, smells it, lifts her head up, decides not to, walks away. This is a conscious decision that Zevia has. Sorry, I'm going to turn this thing off here as well. Uh, this was in such a huge rush trying to get everything done. I have all these people uh, uh, message me. Um, so what it is, is again, it's a conscious decision. And I want to talk about that part of understanding and respecting the fact that our dogs are consciously making decisions when they do something. When they are going out to get some water and they decide not to, it's because there's something in them that says, well, you know, I don't feel very comfortable. I'm, they're obviously not thirsty because if they were thirsty, they would drink the water from the water bowl that they've always drank from. So in this case, they're just essentially going, okay, there's something, something I don't feel. I'm a little bit maybe lonely. Maybe I'm not feeling well today, which is not usually the problem. Uh, I feel normally I would feel thirsty, but I'm not thirsty. I, I don't know why. Why is this happening? walk up to the water bowl and even though they're driven to go to the get some water they they stop right Zevia will stop and she'll think to herself I don't want the water 
I want something else. So that's why she'll stand there for a few seconds and smell the water, kind of pause, not make too much head movement because she is thinking. Why am I here? What do I want? Obviously, I don't want water, but I thought I did. So this is your dog. This is Zevia actually thinking things through. She's reasoning. She's not just some property as the law sees it. She is an actual sentient being with the limited functional aspect of it, of sentience. Zevia is thinking about, okay, I thought I was thirsty. I thought the water would help me. But now that I'm here, I don't want anything. And then she walks away. So she's made a conscious decision. Zevia has made a conscious decision to say, I don't want this water. I thought I did. I don't want it. Oh, well, I'm not thirsty. I'm going to walk away. And you say, okay, well, that's kind of cool and all that. So where does this motivation come from? What does this mean? So we want a human analogy wise, right? Is us walking up to our fridge, opening the door and just staring at the fridge. We know we're hungry. We know we want something to eat, whether or not it's going to help us or not. If it's just comfort food or whatever, we're going to stare in the fridge and go, Hmm, I don't know. And then we open and close it. If you're like me, you know, I open and close my fridge. I'll I'll, uh, I'll walk away, sit down. I'll get some water. I'll get back up and I'll try to go open the fridge again and go, okay, what is it that I want? Then I'll look in the freezer. What do I want from the freezer? I don't want anything. There's nothing there. And I eventually close the fridge or the freezer. And then I go off back to the table. And then eventually, hopefully, I decide to get something healthy to eat as opposed to just looking at the fridge for just some junk food, which is never good. This is what your dog is doing. This is what Zevia does. She's thinking to herself, what is it that I want? Uh, I thought I wanted something. And because she doesn't have a lot of choices that she can't go up into the fridge and open the door unless she's a service dog, right? Zevia's not going to go and open up the fridge and she knows she's not allowed to even if she could or would do so because she would get in trouble. None of my dogs do that. None of the dogs that come in for rehab do that either. She's making a decision. So I, I just want to bring that out to people to recognize the fact that a behavior that we're watching, which is just something to us normally we would never pay attention. Again, your dog walks up to the water, she looks at it, doesn't really taste it, maybe even make, maybe like one or two licks of it and then walks away. It's our dog going up, the same as us, going up to our fridge and going, opening the door and going, ah, there's nothing here. It's a conscious effort. So when you think about it, try to apply that same feeling that you feel in your head of opening the fridge and just being frustrated quietly like there's nothing to eat and apply that to how your dog would be processing that as if your dog was literally a little child that really didn't know what she was doing and can't articulate what she's doing. That's an aspect of reasoning. That's an aspect of your dog thinking, I don't want the water. The water is not going to help me, but I thought I did. Conscious thought. So that's just one of the things I want to go on. And um, um, hey, Rita. Um, yeah, I, I answered your question, right, Rita, in um, in the in my closed group. Okay. So um, so we're gonna go to our viewer questions now. Uh, to my viewer questions, should I say? And I'm just gonna get into the group thing. Uh, it's my reactive, skittish, dangerous dog support group. Anyone can join it. Just say that you saw it on, on my Facebook If uh, for any of the questions. Uh, I do ask that people share my Facebook, like my Facebook page, like my social media, like Instagram, Twitter. Uh, definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel. Help me expand out what I'm doing and, and getting that out to a larger market. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so I'm going to actually go, Jen, If you, I don't know if you're here uh, online, Jen, because um, I just mentioned that earlier uh, about an hour and a bit ago. That I'm going to go online. And and so I'm going to read what Jen has to say. And um, we're going to go from there. Okay. Um, I have a, uh, So Jen writes, I have a Great Dane that I rescued from Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue. We are we are her fourth home. So so this, uh, and her name is Abigail. So Abigail has been now through three previous homes, now going into her fourth home uh, with Jen and her family. Okay, so she goes on. She is the sweetest, sweetest thing. But she does get very aggressive from time to time and goes after my senior boxer who, uh, there's a picture in the post here, uh, I think he's 10 years old, uh, Jen. Uh, sometimes it's over nothing. We try redirecting and, sometime, and stopping the scuffle before it happens. She also likes to herd my kids and has a high prey drive instinct. 
we were given very little info about her before coming to California. The only thing I really know is she used to roam uh, free throughout the day in, in the yard or wherever the home that she used to live in. I could really use some tips on what to help to stop this. We are her forever home no matter what, but I want to be comfortable for all. And um, the nice thing then is Jen has posted a photo of her uh, 10-year-old uh, dog. Um, I don't know what his name is. So we can't really refer to him at all. I, um, I'm not going to say what his breed is because I really don't know what his breed is uh, exactly. And um, we'll just kind of go from there. And let me just see here. Okay. So um, Jen has been referred to uh, a, a, by her vet to a referral to a behavioral specialist that's located at UC Davis. Uh, University of California, Davis, uh, that thing is a... a pretty uh, um, pretty extensive uh, facility um, but uh, you know the thing is that the the issues here right so so Jen I need a bit more information on what it is that you're saying I need more detail uh, I know that you are just obviously recently got her from save Rocky save Rocky is the largest Great Dane rescue in North America um, which is a, a great rescue organization and it's always hard to be politically correct in this day and age uh, but uh, Save Rocky's done an amazing job, Amy and, and her uh, her team of volunteers and all that. Anywhere from 80 to 110 Great Danes and rescue nationally at any given time. And you can imagine how expensive that can be. So they're a great charity. Um, okay, so uh, what Jen says is Abigail's a great, is the sweetest thing, but she does get very aggressive from time to time and goes after my senior boxer over nothing. We try to redirect and stop. So so the issue here, coupled with the fact that she tries to hurt her kids and has a high prey instinct, it's not that she has a high prey instinct. So uh, aspects of prey instinct and predatorial uh, behavior, uh, play drive, uh, prey drive, predatorial drive, these are reflective aspects of the dog's personal species or genus behavior. They're, this is what they're going to do. They're going to either play with uh, a stick or they're going to pretend that they're going after a stick as prey and then in other aspects where you see them, for example, picking up a stuffed animal or stick as well, that same stick and shaking it in their head. That's more of a predatorial behavior because that predatorial behavior of grabbing something in their mouth, again, it can be a stuffed toy and you see them shaking their head. It's the dog's practicing of disabling their target it's an inherent behavior it's genetic it's hereditary it's evolutionary whatever you want to call it but it's part of the behavior and so um, we want to be able to identify certain types of behaviors well so when it comes to um, Abigail hurting her kids as well as a high prey instinct I, there's not a lot of information here Jen so I can't really give you much response other than just generic aspect which is going to be kind of a drag you're welcome to go back in and, and fix your or add to your post uh, to your original post just go in and edit at the top right hand side and add on further information that would be great um so uh, you know uh, the 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 one part when it comes to her her prey instinct because i don't know the context of what you're talking about so i would assume okay so i'm just going to assume that when you're with Abigail out for a walk, she wants to go after every squirrel and after everything like that. So if she lived in a free range in her yard from the previous home that she was in, obviously to be surrendered means she was quite neglected or just neglected, period. Um, that will indicate that she's used to going after things in her yard, wherever she used to live. So she's going to go after things, that behavior. So whether or not it's a prey-driven aspect or if it's a play-driven aspect, that's a question. Um... If she's geared on it and she's barking and she's lunging and pulling at the lead, then it is obviously going to be part of a prey aspect of her behavior. If she was able to get a hold of something that she was going after a prey, after a target like a squirrel, would she kill the squirrel? Would she just go and chase it and corner it? Or would she actually grab it and literally try to break its spine? That's the question. So, um, Because that then also kind of works in with her hurting your kids, uh, hurting, H-E-R-D-I-N-G, hurting your kids, um, also when she goes after your senior boxer. Now, the thing with her, your senior boxer and her, uh, again, this is just simple guess. Uh, well, it's not guess. It's just, it's just going to be generic information because, again, it's really limited information here. Um, if she's going after your senior boxer, 
uh, whatever his name is, then it's going to be an issue that she is not maybe perhaps feeling a competitive aspect of, of it, but anything other than that is her trying to find out where she is. Placement in the family, and I talk about this all the time. Abigail is coming new into the home. The erroneous, the most dangerous assumption that we as human beings do when we adopt a dog into our home is, well, the dog should integrate smoothly into our home should be part of our home, which is not uh, uh, at all possible, but we're expecting the dog to do so. Some dogs absolutely, other dogs not, and dogs that you don't know the history coming in from different aspects of a shelter life or an owner surrender out of desperation or ang angst. Uh, we don't know what the issue is, but we can't expect any dog to integrate themselves into our home and be perfect because it's a silly expectation. The reason is, uh, human analogy wise, again, say for example, you're living on your own. You don't got nobody to live with, and something happens that like you're, you're you're in your your apartment, your apartment, the whole building gets condemned for whatever big fire goes through it, and you have nowhere to live. And then a family says, "Hey, you know what? Uh, I know we don't know you. You and a bunch of other people were were all you know displaced, homeless now because of this fire in your apartment building." You need a place to live. I can only take one person. And then, and then you're like, yeah, I'll go. And so you go with this family. It's just like a rescued dog. You go into this family into a new home. What do you do? Are you expected to pretend immediately that you're in love with all these people in your family and you're enjoying sitting around the table uh, right off the bat and talking about things freely and expecting people to be friendly to you and you're friendly to them in the most genuine aspects of it? When you come from a, a dysfunctional aspect of a rescue dog without a true history, this is the the error that we do is assuming that the dog is going to integrate smoothly into our home, be happy, go lucky, friendly, and get along with our other dogs and everyone, all the humans in, in the household. Unfortunately, when it comes to dysfunction, it is very difficult to do so because, again, the dog is being surrendered, uh, abandoned, discarded, dumped because of behavioral issues. So now you've already got the dog that has dealt with a, a previous family life that has your dog thought was great. And now she's gone to the shelter system or to a rescue system and she's no longer in a home. And so her entire family, her whole entire life has been ripped away from her. And it is literally a human analogy. It's literally as if someone took you away as a child growing up in your family and you had to live somewhere else and we know about the aboriginal displacements of that the residential schools and that abhorrent behavior by the government by taking people away from their families etc and it still goes on now as we know down in the south uh, uh, of the united states imagine that imagine being a child taken away from the only family you knew put into a new family so we're talking about the fire in the house displacing you we're talking about you being a child being displaced into another home arbitrarily with no control whatsoever you're already dysfunctional you're coming in with that dysfunction to begin with and now you're being expected to house yourself into a home and be part of a home that all of a sudden expects you to be great it's impossible it's, it's absolutely a very difficult thing uh, for anyone to integrate uh, I myself would have a very difficult time to do so uh, because I'm old as well and uh, but it just comes down to the point how do you how, how do you expect your dog to integrate so it's uh, it's following how things are going the, the 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 part with dogs is the fact that they are uh, quite you know they're animals okay for for lack of a better description they're animals cross species right different species i mean uh, cohabitation with, a, with an entirely unbelievably different species no, no relation to us not even a chimpanzee or an ape there's no relation to us whatsoever but we are cohabiting oh right on i mean that's cool <laughs> um that's awesome um okay so so again we're asking a dog that comes from a dysfunctional background uh, rescue to integrate themselves into our home seamlessly and be part of our family instantly most dogs will but the dysfunctional dog that has been surrendered won't be integrated into your home because it's really tough for them to trust you. It's really tr tough for them to go and say, well, I just had my loyalties uh, uh, obligated to this previous family. Regardless if they left me outside and treated me horribly, that's the only family I know. And now you're expecting to come into the place and you're all friendly and I'm in indoors and I'm supposed to be here. What am I supposed to do? And for someone who's grateful and dogs being overt codependent, 
for someone being grateful, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I absolutely love being in this home. I love being in this home. And for dogs, their loyalty is incredible. Your dog, Zevia, any of the dogs here, would give their life to defend ours. So how do they prove this when there's no no danger going ahead then they try to prove it in other ways with the home they try to earn their position they try to prove that they belong in your family like I said out of my family of eight I'm number six I know where I am in the family but if I was an adopted child so to speak coming to that family I'd be like where do I belong oh wait I'm at the bottom even though I'm older than you know three of the kids what do I do how do I survive in this home it would be very disruptive for me and then I would be obligated by my own uh, 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 subconscious to be part of the family so I don't get kicked out of the family so I don't get returned to the orphanage etc so your dog is essentially doing the same thing Jen with Abigail she is trying to show you that she belongs in your family so how do we integrate and how do we uh, uh, dissipate any of the anxiety that Abigail has being in your home and how come the, the, the fighting and the aggression with the senior boxer and all stuff. Senior boxer aspects is a really pretty simple thing just judging by the look of what Abigail is and, and by your boxer is the fact that um, Abigail is not confident in, in socialization with other dogs and she is not familiar with the way excuse me she's not familiar with the way your uh, your um, 10 year old uh, dog, I'm sorry, I, I don't usually like to call it, but I just don't know his name, but your 10 year old dog is um, not going to be walking the normal way other dogs walk, the behavior is going to be a bit different, so it's going to throw him off, uh, it's going to throw Abigail off in the way he walks. And, and that's another aspect of uh, field of vision processing that I'll, I'll talk when I'm not going all over the place with this stuff here. Um, so, so that's where it is. Is her behavior when it comes to your ten-year-old dog, your senior boxer, is an aspect of just trying to figure out how that management is between Abigail and your senior ten-year-old boxer dog. Supervision, all these kinds of things. One of the big parts of it here is I can tell that there's a bit of a, 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 a somewhat of an emotional disenfranchisement uh, with both of them. But um, what you want to do is you want to give them equal amounts of attention in that sense of always keeping in mind that your senior boxer regardless if he was two years old or ten years old uh, is that he was there first in the home so you have seniority on that basis that's what you want to rely upon so you want to always refer to your ten-year-old senior boxer uh, whatever his name is uh, Fufu uh, you know want to refer to Fufu first and then you're gonna to refer to Abigail second whenever you do that same with letting Fufu out first to the bathroom and then it would be Abigail and letting Fufu, your 10 year old senior boxer, back into the home and then letting Abigail back into the home in that order. I do a vlog in regards to when dogs OP versus a seniority basis. Go check those out in my earlier broadcast and you'll see what I mean by the seniority aspect and creating a validation and a level of uh, position within uh, the, the family pack uh, as well. So, um, just be vigilant between uh, Abigail and Fufu, the 10-year-old senior boxer. I'm just going to call him Fufu, the 10-year-old senior boxer. And then when it comes to your kids and her trying to herd your kids together, I'm not sure what the context is. What Abigail is doing is uh, is your is Fufu, your 10-year-old senior boxer, doing the same thing. I don't know. We want to find out what type of integration that's going on uh, between uh, Abigail and your kids and how Fufu, your 10-year-old senior boxer, is is, is also interacting with your children so that question then is if uh, if Fufu your 10 year old senior boxer is doing certain things means then Abigail is somewhat making adjustments as well you have to remember every single dog is a predator every single dog the Chihuahua to the Mastiff to the Great Dane every single dog is a predator no ifs, ands, or buts. We have to keep that in mind. Like I've said before and today, you see your dog grabbing a stuffed animal and they shake it. They are literally attempting to break that stuffed animal's back to disable, to handicap it, to prepare it for death. So we always want to keep those in mind. Uh, as I've said before to people and they've seen uh, uh, Walter, 
Um, it's a very significant dog that once cornered me when his handler, um, when I first met him, escaped from his handler, cornered me uh, and uh, attacked me and ragdolled me. And uh, I can tell you, I'm a 190 pound uh, guy, 5 foot 11, and he's taller than me on hind legs. Uh, it's an extremely frightening situation to be placed against that. And uh, it's something you never forget in your life. And it happened more than once. Um, so, so the prey drive, uh, that instinct, just just need a little bit more context, Jen, and then we can kind of uh, 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 elaborate on on that behavior. Um, you know, and, and I admire the fact that you say you we are her forever home, no matter what, uh, and we want to make sure that doesn't escalate in any other uh, uh, negative interactions. So the, the, the one thing is I would, again, maintain the seniority basis between Fufu, your 10-year-old senior boxer, and Abigail, your Great Dane, who I don't know how old she is either. Oh, yeah, I don't know who she, how old she is. So it's, um, it's quite difficult here um, because age is going to play a part in it, uh, whether she's intact or not. You know, all those aspects are just minor details, but age sometimes helps. Um, so when, when she wants to hurt your kids, then you'll need to step in because essentially what she's trying to do is be your second in command and, uh, and, and establish yourself a position in the home. If you show to uh, Abigail that you're, you've got it handled, same with your husband, I've got it handled, you don't have to do this, thank you so much, you want to acknowledge your dog's behavior. If you've asked them to do something and they don't do it, but you have to make them do it, they're still complying. You have to thank them. And it's the same aspect where uh, a human analogy, you're watching a movie with your husband and he gets up to the kitchen and you say, hey, honey, can you get me a glass of water? And he goes, yeah, sure. And he grabs you a glass of water and he brings it to you and he hands it to you. And it, what do you say? Naturally, we say thank you. Even though he'll say, you know, oh, that's, that's cool, sweetie, whatever. He's going to say thank you. I mean, you're going to say thank you to him, right? The acknowledgement. When you're asking your dog to comply to any of your instructions and they do it, they're complying, which means that you must acknowledge the fact that they complied by thanking them. Just say thank you, regular tone of voice, nothing like, no high-pitched tone of voice. And I've, it's, it's, it's interesting, I, a lot of people that I've talked to who, who I, you know, I, I provide free uh, ongoing support by phone, uh, with my clients, a lot of people have said to me, oh yeah, now I notice how other people in the dog parks are talking to their dogs and it's really irritating now. And I went, yeah. And they go, wait, was that me? And I'm like, yeah. And I say, don't worry about it. I used to do it myself too in the beginning. So the high tone and all these aspects of it, when you're talking to your dog, just talk a regular voice as you would with anybody else. You're asking them to do you a favor. And once they do that, then you're like, hey, that's totally cool. It's all good. And, and so again, just focus on that part of uh, communication, stepping in when it's needed, and if there's any other issues at any time, you correct it right away. You must maintain vigilance, you must maintain consistency, because again, every single dog is like a predator. So we can't forget that. We can't go and, uh, and, and disengage from, the, uh, from the, um, uh, the seriousness of that. We can't just slack off when we have a dysfunctional dog because that's when errors will happen and your dog ultimately pays the price if that happens um, there's one I, there's a post in, uh, in in one of the dog groups where um, um, there's, there's one dog is uh, being quite reactive to people in the family and is being quite reactive uh, to other dogs in the family and they're separating the dog and using a gate to separate the, this one dog from the other dogs. Uh, the, apparently, this one dog went and actually, at, uh, you know, I'm not really sure where this is. I don't know how much it is, is logically written. Um, but the claim is that the dog went after their son, who was laying on the floor, no idea how old the son is, and went for his throat and had him by the throat. So the question is, what injuries what injuries were there and by the descriptions there's no injuries so people are right off the bat kill the dog kill the dog kill the dog but the question is 
was the dog attempting to do injury to the son or was a dog trying to establish the fact that he's feeling insecure etc all that stuff the reality is any dog grabbing someone by the throat a dog that is big enough to grab you by the throat is going to kill you if they want to if they want to damage you or a child or anybody they will damage you or that child they know what they're doing and they know how to they know how to exact the amount of pressure and destructive force when they do bite on you. So, um, like I said, we just want to be conscious of where uh, where we are, what we're doing to pay attention to our dogs. Whenever there's something going on, we want to make sure that we're watching our dogs at all times. Even at home, even when you think it's okay to relax and all that stuff. Uh, when you have a dog for the first few days, weeks, whatever... You got to pay attention, got to pay attention. First few weeks actually is, is much more better than that. Um, okay, so uh, like for example, the dogs that I have, absolutely brutal in, in the sense of it, something happens, it can be quite brutal. And as I work with them and I down train them over time and I get them to understand that I'm not only paying attention, but that I see their behaviors. I can tell when they're getting upset. I'm addressing the things in real time with them at the two tenths of a second, and even at their one tenth of a second sometimes. It's letting my dog understand, or letting the dogs, Zevia and all that, understand that I am taking care of them, that I am aware of their presence, that I'm aware of the, the, the dependency, the codependency they have with me. I'm aware of the value they have with me, and at the same time, I am telling them, you don't need to do stuff like this because I have it. I'm handling it. And then it allows our dog to realize we're, hey, I'm being protected by a dad. And that's what we want. Um, so, okay, so the next one I'm going to go is the last one that I'm going to, uh, this will be it, um, is by Sammy uh, Bertini. And uh, funny because I have a little dog named Sammy with only two legs from, from Taiwan. Um, she's a feisty one. So uh, Sammy writes down, baby is a three-year-old chihuahua. I haven't read this yet. Baby is a three-year-old chihuahua who lived with elderly owners and lived with four other dysfunctional dogs. When I met Baby, she wouldn't come out of the wire crate she was in. Her owner grabbed her by the neck and pulled her out. Uh, she allowed me to pet her without peeing on her owner, but she did poop. Baby hid her face in her blankets every time I spoke to her for the first two weeks. She would hide and not come out. I put her in an exercise pen in my living room so she could get used to everything without the opportunity to hide. Baby is deathly afraid of being walked outside as she is so fearful of everything and everyone except me. She lays on her bed and poops every time someone comes to visit. Okay, so uh, Baby is a cute looking little uh, chihuahua. I mean, she's she's probably like 12 pounds. Super, super duper cute. Uh, and you know, sometimes chihuahuas are really happy, friendly, and adorable, and other times they are vicious little uh, uh, angry, uh, upset dogs. Um, so babies three years old, so with an elderly owner and with four other dysfunctional dogs. Okay, so not sure what the other four dysfunctional dogs were like, um, but I'm sure they all felt somewhat in a hoarding situation. Um, oh, okay. Um, uh, we'll need some... Um, uh, sorry, uh, someone just had to message me here. Um, so so all four, all five dogs are going to have dysfunctions. And they're most likely, if they're with an elderly couple, which wouldn't be able to walk them out and if they didn't have a backyard as per se they're going to have dysfunctions uh, sometimes elderly people tend to become complacent with the way their environment is and the way they're doing things and then that sets a uh, very difficult routine in the lifestyle of each and every single dog in the home not only do they understand the the this the, the the basis of their home environment but also they understand there's a certain stagnant behavior and a stagnant presence of uh, environment in the home that the dogs are going to be existing in when they become accustomed to that. When they become accustomed to that because they're adaptive dogs, every single dog is adaptive, right? Predatory behavior. Every single dog is adaptable, which means that they not have only adapted to that, but they've also kind of lost their ability to want to socialize and want to integrate with curiosity to the outside world. And instead, they have been hoarded, coddled, and felt to feel somewhat... Um, inferior as a sentient being okay so um, it's kind of too bad and when when she says when I first met baby she wouldn't come out of her wire crate she was in so that means uh, there's a, a chance that she was probably in there for quite a long period of time uh, uh, and probably the other dogs were her owner grabbed her by the neck and pulled her out 
she allowed me to pet her without peeing on her owner, but she did poop. So it's kind of a sad thing to read, right? That this old senior owner just grab leaves leaves baby in a in a wire crate, and then just yanks her out by the neck. And then she, uh, the fact that she says she allows me to pet her without peeing on her owner, but she did poop. Um, you know. It, 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 it's it's a high anxiety aspect that's happening, which means, uh, which I'm pretty sure means that she has been staying inside there, um, uh, that she's been staying inside there uh, for for a length of time in her crate. Um, uh, sorry, is this, I'm getting messages all over the place today. Um, so that she spent a lot of time of her life in the crate, and she's not used to being out out of her crate, and more than likely too is because if she ever reacted in a negative way. I suspect that there was some, obviously, I mean, anybody here listening, reading this is going to say the same thing as has been physical abuse. So baby uh, very likely has been physically abused. Um, there's no reason for a dog to pee or poop out of fear unless they think they're in trouble or they think that another dog or another person in the home is in trouble as well. So it's a reactionary aspect of it, right? Or consequential to the, to the, uh, to the events that are happening out of their stagnant, somewhat sedentary stagnant environment so um her to be in different aspects outside of the safety of her wire crate there's a further dysfunction on that which um again why she's outside as well it's going to be agoraphobic agoraphobic i hope i'm pronouncing it right um uh, you know fear of being outdoors and it's going to be similar from the wire crate to the rest of the home to outside into the neighborhood running around as well so that's a difficulty on her end um, she allows you to pet her without peeing on her owner at the time, but she did poop, right? So it's an anxiety-driven aspect. It's not the, you know, because I talked about this before about fight or flight and how I find that that is somewhat of really an immature observation. And I know that, you know, genius scientists and Darwin and all that stuff, right? But I, I, I would disagree because uh, primarily most animals are in a defensive measure of behavior no matter what. And it's how the reaction to that right of, of any exposure of risk to them um because it's a logic and an emotional doubt process that happens where the dog the animal makes the decision etc um i'm gonna keep that down a bit so so she's gonna poop because of the anxiety in her body right she's having a feeling maybe she's got internal injuries from from prior abuse if she was never injured then that is gonna definitely point to a strong dysfunctional uh, behavior of uh, of low self-esteem she has no codependency aspects like talk about dogs having dependency issues uh, such as interdependent intradependent codependent and then when it comes to interdependent there's um there's a uh, modular inter uh, modular interdependency and non-modular interdependency as well as when it comes to dependencies and in, in, in general it's going to be uh, ladder dependency where the dog is then seeking affection from whoever is best next to, to satiate their dysfunctions and then codependency aspects which uh, by the looks of it by the sounds of it uh, due to lack of socialization for baby she has pretty well none of it which means that it's nice in a way <laughs> that you can actually help to manage and massage baby towards a codependency so you, in a way you have it there's still always going to be fear and reluctance on her end but you can kind of create a strength of bond where she will start to trust you as you create a interdependency with her and a codependency with the baby that you can kind of have a rely upon you and somewhat feel brave enough through interactions with you to then bravely go off and be uh, associating with other people uh, baby hid her face in her blankets every time I spoke to her for the first two weeks she would hide and not come out. So that is going to go back. Hi, Sue. I hope your husband's uh, good. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Momo is enjoying the dog food and uh, your other cat is enjoying the cat food. I mean, it's really nice cat food. Uh, I don't have cats, so I'm, I'm glad that we could help you out. And, you know, Debbie says uh, that she's happy to help you as well. Um, okay, so getting back to baby hiding her face in her blankets and, and uh, all that stuff that is going to be a point where it's going to be back to the verbal abuse. Either it's physical and or verbal abuse, but let's face it. Anyone reading that is going to say, baby hid her face in her blankets every time I spoke to her for the first two weeks. She would hide and not come out. It's verbal abuse. So how is that verbal abuse? How did that happen? What's, what's the level of verbal abuse that has happened? Um, what, 
Okay, sorry. I'm going to read what, because uh, of the stuff scrolling up here. Uh, Rita says, love your vlog in the middle of the night. I always learn something new. We did years of obedience training with Guru, or her, your, uh, Rita's previous dog. She would, could lay down in a row of dogs. I could walk far away. She wouldn't budge until I called her, etc. But our trainer knew little about dog behavior when a scuffle occurred. So we learned nothing about the subjects you're talking about. Thank you for teaching us what you know for sharing so willingly so we can keep our dogs and others safe as possible. Thank you as well, Rita. Um, like I says, I, I'm hoping to uh, save up some money so I can get some equipment um, to do uh, podcasting and um, and then do live video. So instead of me just talking to the screen here and reading stuff off on another screen and all that, I'm really hoping that we can do you know uh, the videoing at the same time and hopefully maybe YouTube will be that vehicle to, to do so and expand it out. Um, obviously, I really enjoy doing this, uh, uh, the training aspect of it. It's just tough when I don't have enough information. And it's even better if I can live speak with somebody about it. So then it's cool. Oh, Yahoo, right? So then we have a, a real-time interaction. Okay, so uh, baby hiding her face on blankets is, is again, uh, it's most likely verbal abuse whatsoever, if not coupled with some emotional abuse. Uh, I'm sorry, physical abuse. And, um, you know, if she is not uh, reacting to you in any of the adverse... Uh, tones of voice that you have or any sudden noises then um, you know it, it, it's a huge um, low level of self-esteem extremely low level of self-esteem I put her in an exercise pen in my living room so she could get used to everything without the opportunity to hide yeah no, that's 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 pretty cool um, uh, I, what I would encourage you to do Sammy is to actually take her with you on to the couch if you're allowing your your dogs onto the couch um, all my dogs are on the couch and one of them, you know, I've got like circa 1910, uh, uh, antique couch. It's a hundred plus years old. That's completely ruined. Um, after the first few damages, you're just like, you're done. Right. So, um, th now the dogs love it because they get to lay on it. They don't get yelled at anywhere. Uh, they, well, they never got yelled at anyways. Um, but they're like, okay, well, we're not going to get this, you know, this piece of wood taken away from us now. It's like in, in all that. Um, okay. So, uh, sorry, uh, putting her exercise pen in the living room, I would encourage you to kind of bring her onto the couch with you. So then, like I said, this is a great opportunity to start massaging uh, the aspect of codependency with her and somewhat some interdependency to falsely artificially build up her self-esteem right see these aspects but like I say everything I talk about it has a multi-dimensional aspects of application it's just because it's so simple it means that it has to apply to so many things um, so uh, I would put her onto the couch and not have her sit with you just put her on the couch and then allow her to kind of uh, move herself towards you uh, over time if she doesn't move towards you, then you would just move her a couple of inches towards you. And then 10 minutes later, a couple of inches towards you. And you would just do that throughout the whole time frame. If you get up to walk away, you're going to acknowledge baby that you're getting up to walk away, etc. Right? You, you, I thought, Sam, you had other dogs. I thought you had Great Danes or something as well. Um, okay, but anyhow... Um, Baby is deathly afraid of being walked outside as she is so fearful of everything and everyone except me. She lays on her bed and poops every time someone comes to visit. Okay, so uh, she lays on her bed and poops every time someone comes to visit. That's that same part of exposure and all that stuff. So that's why while you start doing the exercises, having her move towards you closer and closer on the couch. That, oh, okay, come on, wait, Sammy. Hey, Sammy. Hey, Sammy. There's Sammy. Sammy wants to say hi. Okay, hi, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. So, um... What you what you want to do? I'm just gonna lay Sammy up this way. Hello, Sammy. This is Sammy. Um, so so um, when she she's on the bed and poops every time, that's gonna be similar to what her behavior was. Um, sorry, I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer. That's gonna be close to what her behavior was uh, when you saw her at the 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 elderly owners. So you wanna. Oops, I'm just gonna bring this over here. So um. Uh, it's going to be similar to that behavior that she had when she was at the uh, at the whatchamacallit people's uh, the elderly owner's home um, you, you're going to oh, okay what's this here you, sorry guys Sammy Sammy with no legs Sammy needs a new wheelchair too she is having tr trouble walking now um, yeah she's from Taiwan Ken um, okay, so when she's on the bed and, and, and pooping and all that stuff, uh, if someone does come over to visit, uh, you'll want to... Actually, Sammy with an IE, 
Rita. Sorry. Um, uh, so that's going to be a part of the same 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 thing as you want her near you on the couch, and just working on that simple tool, that simple technique of just gradually moving over to you a, one or two inches every five, ten, fifteen minutes throughout the day, at night, wherever it is. If she sleeps on the bed with you, same aspect of it. If she sleeps further away, then you just kind of move her closer to you, and you're just essentially going to passively. Uh, thank you. Yeah, she is great. Sammy. Sammy. Sammy, you see that blink on the right side of her eye? Um, okay, so so basically you're just you're just gonna bring um, uh, baby towards you over that time period. It's a really simple technique. Minky, Minky, um, you just bring her towards you, and that's gonna build up an interdependency eventually. But it's gonna build up the codependency, and then it's gonna build up her self esteem, and then you will find that she'll start anticipating the uh, hand movements from you. And she may end up very well moving herself over towards you on purpose and seeking attention from you. And that's where you build the codependency. And then you build the codependency above an average level of codependency, which then allows you then to start developing an interdependent behavior on her part. And it's just that simple. Um, sorry. I should actually stop saying that because... Um, uh, it's simple to me, and um, I, I don't want to make it sound complicated to other people. Um, uh, you, yeah, Minky's such a brat. Um, uh, and he is going back to Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Um, I'm just waiting for them to follow through on, on things that they're supposed to. But um, so, you, you, you know, you, you just want to be able to integrate the dog back into your life so that they're looking through their own uh, own fears that the world, the shoe is not going to drop. The other shoe is not going to drop. The world is not going to blow up. You want to basically convince um, baby, your chihuahua, when she's afraid or she's worried or she's scared or something bad is going to go on, that she can come to you, her mom, to be taken care of. Just like our child, like you know, if you have a child, human analogy. If you have a child that's scared and, and wakes up in the middle of the night thinking that their universe is gonna blow up, even though you say, well, that's in ten billion, 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 billion years, and will long be gone by then. They're still afraid because they don't understand the process of what's going on, right? Like I say, dogs process time through abstract memory, yada yada. So this means that on the end of a baby's aspect of it is you want to assist her in knowing that the horrible thing that she's always afraid of that causes her to stress defecate or stress urinate is something that you already are anticipating by bringing her in closer, right? It works on the abandonment issue that she has. It works on the lack of socialization that she has. It works on the low self, well, absent of self-esteem, everything. It just works on that. And you'll see over time, uh, Sammy, that you'll you'll get the integration. Uh, so the last line is, baby is deathly afraid of being walked outside as she is so fearful of everything and everyone except me. Right, so she's created the bond with you, which is somewhat kind of sounding like an interdependent aspect of it right now, but it is a codependency. So when she does have this bond with you outside, I'm not sure exactly what her, her, her behavior is, what her actions are, but what you want to do is you want to re-engage with Sam, uh, with ba Sammy, sorry, Sammy, <laughs> Sammy started moving, with baby every every so often, every 15 feet, 7 feet, 12 feet, no more than 20 feet at any time. You're like, my gosh, 20 feet, I'm not even going to get past the, 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 the block, uh, the around the block in an hour. That's right, you don't. You want to take care of baby's issues so she can trust you, that she can know that you're there to, rely on her to touch her to let her know you're there at all times and you want to have a nice calm voice with it and if you have to stop every 7 12 15 feet then you stop every 7 12 15 feet even 20 feet but you don't want to go too far out because she's going to start to tunnel into her fear her dysfunctions and then you're going to be like well nothing happened then it's not working uh, as i said before I, I have dogs that i've taken care of that i've rehabbed that are extremely skittish can't be outside whatsoever you see the minky video for example couldn't be outside and all that stuff he's still you know skittish but he will still go outside um and if he has a problem i can bring him to me he will come to me same thing i talk about a great dane named nina that also came from um uh, uh 
uh, Taiwan had her mouth wired shut. You could see it was all wired. It was a horror, uh, really bad scarring. She couldn't be outside uh, around traffic. She couldn't be down the hallway of the apartment I was living in at the time. Couldn't walk her from the front door of the apartment to the parking lot, which is 200 meters away, which is about 600 and uh, 600 and, and like 67, 672 feet. She couldn't walk out there if it was dark without having issues. And if it rained, uh, Nina uh, would completely shut down and freeze in the rain standing there. And in Vancouver, the rain is horrifically heavy and she would be, we would just be drenched and we would move 20 feet, like six, like five and a half, six meters at a time. We'd move 20 feet, have to stop because she would freeze up again and freeze up again and freeze up again. It would take us 45 minutes to walk. 200 meters and um, absolutely soaked and all that stuff but over time over time was able to walk her and 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 we were able to walk downtown and walk around to the off-leash parks and she'd go up to people including Asians because that's you know a dog that comes from Asia that has had a horrific life or a meat dog from a dog meat farm um, they're always afraid of Asians, especially men, because those are the tendencies, sometimes women. But anyways, long story short, uh, Nina was able to walk around and, and be socialized, and she eventually got adopted by Kathy Chow, who runs my fluffy friend's pet store in, uh, in town. Um, and she's a trainer herself, so obviously she did not understand what was going on with Nina. And the problem is a lot of times people just push and push and push too hard, and or else they just forget and they just become complacent or they just ignore things on purpose and that's what happens um so when you're out there with baby talk to her Re every seven to 20 feet stop touch her in a certain way um just don't overdo the touching just re-engage with her reconnect with her every time because that's what's happening to her uh when you're in the house she's sitting beside you 10 20 feet away move her in move her in towards you i'm sorry 10 20 feet <laughs> I mean, every 10 or 20, uh, 5, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, move her in towards you an inch or two each time to do so. Um, you know, and her laying on the bed and pooping every time someone comes in to visit. Um, I'm not sure what your interaction is when she does pee or poo, when, when that does happen. If you, um, if I knew more, that'd be great. I, so I'm really going to, uh, so anyways, those are the answers there for now, Sammy, and same with you, um, um, uh, Jen. As well, I want to thank uh, the people who have signed up to my YouTube channel. I'm up 466 followers now on YouTube. I'm trying to get to that magic 1,000, and um, that's going to be a bit of a uh, of a time. It's never going to be easy, um, but I am, like I say, is eventually going to transition this all over to uh, live podcasting or live vlogging on the YouTube channel instead, and uh, hopefully. Um, I can take some of you guys with me to, to follow me and watch me over there instead. All right, so I'm going to get going. I'm not going to linger. I want to thank some of the people who have given me some excellent advice in the past few days uh, about how to run my vlog and how to improve it and how to streamline it and to make more sense of it. And uh, I really appreciate uh, constructive feedback. I don't care if it's critical or whatever. Everything has a sense of truth and, and honesty in, in it all. Um, so thank you all so much. Please be kind. It is a Wednesday. You have Halloween tomorrow. The fireworks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to include in this vlog and I'm going to post it on my page as well. Uh, what I do with dogs when it comes to fireworks. And how to keep them from freaking out and barking at other, at the outside noises and etc. You know, because it's, it's the sound of the fireworks, the reverberations. They can feel it and all that stuff. So we're going to work with that and I'll, I'll post it on how to deal with that for Halloween and everything. Uh, yeah, that's right. I will, next time I talk to you all will be Friday, uh, November 1st. May you all have the greatest times and I really hope that uh, you can be kind to other people. Get past some of the things that can kind of stress us out. Uh, look at the beautiful things in this world and just really realize that you have the capacity to do amazing things no matter what. And it doesn't matter how much that you're expecting out of somebody. It's what you yourself can um, reward yourself. Make sure that you pay yourself back by uh, splurging on some incredibly cheap, fun, comfort food. Oh, cool, Mary. Um, you know, 
buy yourself a chocolate bar, buy yourself a, a Turkish delight, buy yourself a wonder bar, um, you know, buy yourself something kind of cool just to reward yourself once you've done something good, you know, splurge, go crazy, take care of yourself, reward yourself for all the selflessness that you've done as well. Um, yeah, fireworks would be a great topic. Um, uh, let, let, yeah, I, I wish I wish I could. Um, well, I, you know, Christina, I, I actually have one about the fireworks itself showing it in action. And like I say, I'll post it up there on my Facebook page later on tonight so everyone um, gets a chance of it. All right. Uh, yeah, because tomorrow's the, the 31st. Hmm. Okay. All right, everybody take care. Thank you so much and have a good night.